Okay, so actually we will we'll segue now with uh, uh, Lisa Parker playing the role of Jeff Ginsburg <laughs> to, to summarize. All right. Thank you. Um, so since um, the, our, my two fellow panelists uh, both mapped out uh, many of the, the issues, and actually uh, Wendy had given us such a, a good introduction to the, the terrain of issues raised by return of results, um, I will focus in the summary uh, just to highlight a couple of, of uh, particular opportunities that I think uh, eMERGE uh, presents in this regard. Um, our, early, our morning discussion certainly highlighted um, that Emerge is engaged in and poised to continue um, the research on the clinical implementation, this middle ground before we actually get to uh, clinical impl implementation uh, broadly and fully, um, that eMERGE has the opportunity to ask the questions about what we should be doing uh, with regard to, to all of the normative issues uh, and, and uh, uh, preference, preferences and educational needs uh, that were recently recently uh, discussed. Um, I think that with the opportunity to continue doing site-specific as well as network-wide projects, we have an opportunity for innovative pilot studies around return of research results as well as as comparative uh, studies, uh, indeed capitalizing on the, the non-uniform healthcare system that we have and differences across institutions and their electronic health record systems, um, and indeed uh, the uh, fact that some of our eMERGE sites, um, uh, the healthcare system is, is also involved in ensuring lives, um, and so that we do have an opportunity for some of the um, economic and uh, broader policy uh, examination uh, that's been raised, um, that we can do this across time and in, in two senses, um, both uh, you know, longitudinal uh, study um, querying you know, deep diverse phenotypes um, and also across the lifespan that we do have um, you know, pediatric patients, we have um, you know, much older patients and that the, uh, I, I would suggest that at least some say, despite the ACMG uh, recommendations, that the age of the uh, person in whom the result uh, is identified uh, may indeed matter, whether this is an elderly person for whom that disease risk um, may uh, may not uh, be likely to be manifesting, uh, or you're talking about a newborn or a pediatric patient. Um, and so I think uh, very briefly in the summary, so we do have time for discussion, um, both with uh, Gail and with Susan and then everyone, I just want to emphasize that what I have found eMERGE to have um, most uh, particularly in contrast to any other uh, research setting um, or, or research network um, is that there's an integrated infrastructure for conducting the empirical ELSI research and that return of research results is a key uh, topic for this um, uh, integration. Uh, there, there are certainly practical logistical issues, um, but that those are so in, uh, intimately intertwined with the ethical, the legal, the economic, um, the, the social um, aspects, social risks, if you will, um, of returning results, and that eMERGE has proved through two phases thus far that uh, really more more than, than uh, more than elsewhere, and perhaps more than the LCCers to some extent, there's a real integration of empirical ethics researchers, policy researchers into uh, the science, the science. Uh, and therefore there's a real opportunity here, I think, to examine both the, what I'll call the individual participant level issues as well as now system-wide uh, uh, issues of economics, the impact on healthcare cost, uh, quality assurance issues, data security and participant privacy uh, issues uh, at a systemic level, as well as looking at the uh, you know, clinician preparedness and needs, the decision support, and uh, participant responses, including as we go forward and consider the implications for families. Um, uh, 
who, who may be outside of the, the given health care system or beyond the, the electronic health record, implications for them, liability issues, um, and just sheer uh, patient, uh, family member responses. So um, I think eMERGE is you know, well positioned uh, to continue to try to address the issues raised by return of results. And I will stop. Would you like to uh, kind of lead the polling of the other? Oh, I will, yes. I, I'm, absolutely. I had intended, in fact, to turn on uh, now Gail if you wanted to uh, to weigh in on this discussion, and then we'll have Susan and then open it up. Yeah, so, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things we talked a lot, we had several calls, and um, our panelists did a great job of, you know, being prepared, and, you know, the quote, luck saver for prepared. Um, uh, we talked a lot about how, you know, what kind of balance of discovery and implementation work that where you're getting results that you can return to people that have value to them. Um, and, but also there are good LT questions, there are good discovery questions, and that's actually sort of how we kind of honed in on this, you know, more penetrance uh, gene idea, and, and I'm very much in favor of that, and I, I like pharmacogenetics, and there, there are a lot of people working in that space. I mean, we have some good pharmacogenetic data, but I think as far as returning things to actual people and learning how to do that, that the highly penetrant stuff is more, you know, critically demanded, and that there is a really lot we could learn not just about which variants are pathogenic, but about which variants aren't pathogenic and issues like penetrance and other things. A lot of key questions in that space. So as we kind of went over, well, what do we want to learn? What are our unique strengths? To me, that idea of more highly penetrant conditions jumped out more and more. That's all I have to say. Um, Susan, did you want to uh, chime in? Sure. Um, I want to go back to the question of uh, what unique opportunities eMERGE may have in the return of results space. And I've got a couple thoughts on that. Um, first of all, I think eMERGE probably needs to, as well as can, test and go beyond the ACNG statement on return of results, return of incidental findings, actually, in clinical sequencing. Because, of course, that was about clinical sequencing, and Green et al. is agnostic on its implications, at least in the text, for research. But eMERGE is already facing these issues, as we know, in the research sphere. So um, an ACMG in that statement was modest um, appropriately in saying this is a first pass, we need a better evidence base. Uh, so I think eMERGE can really play a leadership role there including on the specific question of the role of uh, participant and patient preference on uh, what to look for and uh, what to return. Those, as everyone knows, are contested questions. Um, another domain I think where eMERGE has uh, unique capability is digging in on some of the consent questions. And Iftikhar had on his slide some of the cutting edge ones like consent to include genomic data in the EHR. Others are consent to share with kin, consent for posthumous use. So there are really some emerging uh, important uh, issues. Third, I think um, at least I'd like to put a, a proposal out there to, uh, to be innovative and take a hard look at how we are defining actionability. Because um, I was very interested in Heidi's slide about developing a scoring scale on actionability. But overwhelmingly, the dialogue on actionability has been driven by uh, investigator and clinician views of actionability and has largely ignored, I think, participant and patient views on what do they see as actionable in their lives. What about reproductive use? I understand that would open a Pandora's box, but what, what are their priorities? What about life significance, even if the clinicians can't fix the, um, the disease or the risk factor? So I think actionability needs a lot of work. Um, and the last thing I would throw in is the description of the rich diversity in the eMERGE populations including uh, diversity by ancestry, opens a really important opportunity. So much 
work on return of results and LC work more broadly suffers from a lack of diverse populations in which to ask the question, are there differences in view on what people want to have happen? I think that's a really important domain that it sounds like Emerge can uniquely contribute to. I want to clarify, this is Gail, that I am not endorsing any of the opinions of the ACMG statement uh, with regard to mandatory return or return to minors when I say that the list, the actual list of genes is a good starting place for us to look at for what is, um, you know, agreeable to many people as actionable. I think there are more actionable genes. There, there are a couple that I am dicey about on the list. I, I might have got the 57 point thrown off. <laughs> genes, I think people have generally a positive review of, um, whereas the, what to do with that, those variants, it, there, I think is a wonderful research space for eMERGE. What do people actually want? Not just what does the ACMG say should happen, but what do people want? What do patients want? What do providers want? Um, and I think yeah, that's this is Mark. I, um, <clears throat> I think this is a, a really high-profile issue. As one of the authors on the paper, first of all, I'll say, Gail, you only get one gene off, all right? That you're wow. <laughs> no, I'm not um, finding the other two. I'm okay with them. All right, good. Glad to hear it. So, um, but, but I think, you know, one of the things that we faced in, um, in creating the statement on the list is that, as everyone here knows, there's been almost no research in this area at all. And so while we gave it our best effort based on what we, you know, uh, thought was a reasonable way to proceed, I think the whole process would, would dramatically welcome, um, you know, actual formative research about, you know, how do people feel about this, what's really the best way to do it, and, and, and develop a research agenda around these types of questions. Now, I don't know if Heidi is still on the call or not, but I know she's leading the ongoing process that's being developed relating at least to the list. And so you may have some insights in terms of your perspective on that type of research. Heidi, how are you? I think Heidi got off. Okay. I saw her, I saw her step off. But I, I, will, I just want to acknowledge that the paper was very clear that an evidence base needed to be developed. And I think, you know, the paper uh, that Wiley Burke led on opportunistic screening and the need for real evidence around the fact that these people are coming in and largely asymptomatic as to the 56, so what do we know about, um, do we have enough evidence in that context? That's a really important set of questions. That we can address and emerge, absolutely. So as a non-specialist in this area, um, but having the benefit that when you're a, a grandparent, you get to see digital natives, the millennials. And I think, well, what would they think of this entire discussion? And they would think this was laced with nothing but degrees of paternalism. Yes. There was no option at one end that sounded like no paternalism, which is, can I just have all my results, right? and now. why are you withholding them from me? Yes. So I guess it seems to me at least some recognition that this space has moved a lot in just the amount of time since eMERGE was created. The public expectation of, well, you accept the risks of getting it, as, you know, just telling it like it is, but I want everything about me. It doesn't seem to have been in this discussion of incidental findings. I, I slid over that slide. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think that has been in the debate. I mean, I think that was part of the original impetus for even a decade ago raising the idea that participants in research and patients might want their incidental findings or even their research results. And I mean, I see the trend moving toward providing choice uh, so that some people might indeed say, I want a ton. I mean, in fact, I define actionability much more broadly than you do. Some people might even say, actionable or not, give it to me now. Whether you understand it or not, give it to me now, because it's mine. Mm -hmm. And some people might be much more cautious. I don't think we know yet about what frequencies are attached to those attitudinal positions. We need to know, but ultimately, I suspect, we need to have a range of options that people can avail themselves of. 
Yes. And is it any any more moral to ignore that view, give me all my data now, it's my data, uh, than it is to say, no, I don't want that data, don't return that for me, or I don't want that result. We all agree that we need to do that. But what about the person on the other side? And we just saw data that for the pharmacogenomic stuff, the, the error rate is down there 1% or less. Uh, well, you know, why, why is this really something that we shouldn't return? Um, we're, are, are we hiding behind these, these constructs that we've created? Um, research, you know, was designed because you didn't know the answer. And, and now we're, we're getting findings that are, that are true, this data. And should not, even if we can't interpret the data, can we give the data to the participants? I think we're back to the CLIA discussion. <laughs> um, maybe or not. Uh, I mean, we could write a, a, a research protocol that said, and, and we will take the uh, genetic information and give it to the participants. Could we not? No. Sure. Yeah. Actually, there is one like that. It's yeah. called the multiplex study. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it was done with, with specific candidate genes, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. But we could, we could do a GWAS, mm -hmm. or what is close to GWAS. Yes, it overlaps the implementation uh, conundrum that perfect is the enemy of useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm all for giving people their data, and I'm probably at one of the few places that would let us give back non clear data, but my impression from my peers is that many places would not be excited by Well, sharing. but uh, so is there, yeah, just, just to extend that, right? So uh, I think in the 21st century that's saying knowledge is power, and the people that have the power want to keep it, right? I mean, that's no, what the millennial would say. Knowledge is liability. Yeah. It well, also no, yeah, no liability is about institutional well. power. Right. <laughs> It also su suggests that, that eMERGE is in a good position to um, study the next step and not just the next day or next month or even six months out uh, response of individuals uh, to having received their results, but in fact over a certain amount more time what they actually do with it and what the effect on uh, demand for healthcare services is, uh, how that links up to clinical practice guidelines for actually responding to the level of, uh, call it, you know, disease risk or, or um, uh, preventive interventions or whatever that, that are, are recommended. Um, you know, do people come in and ask for more because they're now more concerned? Do, do, does it actually inspire them to follow a clinical practice guideline that's recommended? Um, and eMERGE is, is especially well-suited, uh, structured, to be able to, to ask those questions and address them. eMERGE is also a really importantly positioned to deal with the fact that more and more people have access directly to their electronic health record or some version of it. So if it's in the electronic health record, uh, you would think sooner or later it's going to be available to the individual. And what are the implications of that? I mean, for example, ACMG talked about a dialogue ensuing between the clinician who's gotten the 56 back from the lab or whatever came up in the analysis of 56 and the patient. But if the patient has full access to the electronic health record, that's not much of a filter, not much of a screen. It can be a source of education. So I think the trend, inclu including among millennials, toward increasing access to the EHR has to be dealt with and eMERGE could really play a leadership role there. Yeah, I think the other point that's uh, worthwhile to note relating to that access issue is that as uh, um, uh, Justin uh, et al. pointed out in our Crossing the Omics Chasm uh, Viewpoint article, is it's not clear at this point what all is going to be represented in the electronic health record. Um, in other words, would it just be um, the results that are deemed by someone to be actionable and we don't give any of the other information. Um, I think most of us believe it's not going to be an entire variant file, but that's another type of research question that could be asked is what, you know, what do our patients think would be the, a reasonable amount of information to have in there and how would they like to access it within a patient portal or a person, tethered personal health record environment. There, there's a lot of real opportunity here. I think something to remember is that we are having this discussion about return of results in part because of the behavior of generations of previous researchers, some of whom basically said, here's this information, and if you have questions, talk to your doctor. 
And so now we have clinical organizations that are conditioned that when a researcher says, I want to give a research subject information, their knee jerk is no, because my doctors are going to suffer as a result of it. So if we are going to return the information, we have to scope it appropriately that we are in a position to answer and analyze the questions that are asked. So just to follow up on that, I did a study years ago where we were measuring LPA and we were required to ask every provider if their patients could get their LPA a back along with their rest of their lipid panel. And most of the providers said no, their patient couldn't because they didn't want it, they didn't want to know about it, they didn't want to explain it to the patient, they didn't want to incorporate it into care. Um, and I think to me that emphasizes how important it is to pick something to return that is important in clinical care that the providers will want to know about and will need to learn about. Yeah, that often happens because the patients are asking the doctor for it yeah. instead of the doctors responding to what the patients want, rather than the other, rather than imposing on the patients mm -hmm. yeah, something he thinks they need. It's a version of healthcare on. being mostly for doctors as opposed to for <laughs> patients. Those were the days. We still have some more time to. If there, I, I, I find it curious that you say the, the, the data wouldn't be deposited in the EMR. Well, it may not be deposited in EPIC because it can't be, or in CPRS. But isn't it in fact part of the healthcare record regardless? If it's a lab test that comes back, even if it's faxed in and it's not incorporated, it's part of the record. Well, uh, not necessarily, Larry. Um, but the the example that we used is, is, is the ancillary system, which is if there's a system that's tied to the electronic health record, but uh, we don't have all of the file data for the images um, in the electronic health record. We have a way that you can view the image through the electronic health record, but the data does not reside in the EHR. And there are specific performance issues uh, where we think the huge volumes of uh, genomic data, if stored within what we consider the EHR environment, would degrade performance to the point that it would become unusable. Granted that it's in a separate platform and in a separate system the way that, for example, radiology is in many, if not most, healthcare systems. But if a patient signs a consent and says, I want my MRI sent to my other doctor, it's part of the record insofar as it is transmitted to that other system. Or if a patient now under MU2 says, I want that data, they can get the data. It's well, but, but I think a good example is if you look at lab tests, okay? Um, in many places, when you order a serum sodium, they do a 20. Um, because it's cheaper to just run it through the multiplexer. Yes, and they throw the other 19 have. away, and you can't have them. Um, also, they run QA samples with lots of tests. And if you want to see a disaster, see what happens when the QA results start bleeding into the clinical results and everybody gets confused as heck. Um, so there are a lot of results that are collected by ancillary systems which never come across the wire. Yes, but if you run a panel of 56 genes and those are returned to the clinician at, at, with a result file and a PDF, um, and you're in the position where you're going to reinterpret VUSs, um, they, they better be in some ancillary system that's considered legally part of the EMR. I think it's a, uh, yeah, uh, a, a terminological difference. When we say EMR, we mean Epic or its market partners, as opposed to the entire clinical digital record. It's, it's right. I think, versus Mike Gaziano, I think there is a distinction, even if it's behind the firewall, between a research database and a clinical research. database. If you're doing a randomized trial and it happens to be, you know, the servers have to be ha happen to be on on your premises, those those data are secured data and not accessible to clinicians for for routine care in any way. Certainly there can be a dialogue between a participant in a trial who wants to get access to the data, but only with the investigators that are involved in that trial. It's not as if he could go into the medical records office, sign a form, and say, I want my randomized trial, uh, uh, secured randomized trial data, and that the medical records office would be required to give it to him. So they are really separate enclaves, even though they're maybe contained behind the firewall of, of a health system. 
Right, and I think I was talking about only CLIA results ordered for clinical care. Right, and right. That's, a, that's, that, that's a difference. But but now, but we're starting to blur the line between um, CLIA results for research purposes that are that are will eventually find their way back to a, a, a medical record. Some of, some of which might find their way back, some of which might be retained within an enclave, a research enclave, because they're not ready for prime time consumption. Um, so, there, so those lines are be, beginning to blur, but, there are, but, but not everything that's contained behind a health system is, uh, is all treated the same, and, and, and a patient doesn't have the exact same access to all of that data at, at all points in time. So this is this an is excellent gosh. preamble to the next topic, uh, which will occur after a 15-minute break. Now, having shown that we can actually do a 15-minute break, you'll see 20 on your schedule, but we're actually going to restart in 15 minutes. And we could almost pick this up uh, in mid-sentence, <laughs> but, uh, but we won't. Okay, so we'll see you at uh, 15 minutes past the hour.